Amen. What a great atmosphere of worship we feel in this house today. Amen. Let's, let's lift up the name of Jesus one more time. Come on. Lift your voice. Lift your hands. Lift your hearts. I know it's Pastor Appreciation Month, but we're still here to worship God. Still here to worship God. Come on. With a loud voice. Surely it's not too much. Surely it's not too much. Has he done anything for you? Surely this is not too much. Surely this is not out of character for the church of the living God. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. You may be seated. I just want to say a few things before we get started. Uh, I do believe the Lord is going to confirm his word this afternoon. Uh, through whatever means, I don't know what it is. He didn't tell me exactly what, but I do know he's wanting to confirm the word today. And uh, this month, uh, obviously, is Pastor Appreciation Month, and uh, the theme that we're kind of going with is, is transformation. Uh, Kevin mentioned it earlier, so um, I do feel like that is the right theme for this church, and, and because I feel like we're going somewhere. I feel like, I feel like we're transforming, and I, I feel like we're, we're drawing closer to the purpose and the will of God. Amen. But I do want to honor Pastor James. Uh, thankful for the opportunity. Uh, two, maybe two and a half years ago, um, what he saw in me uh, to, to come up here and to, to minister the gospel. Um, so I'm thankful for that, and I do honor him. I do honor Sister James in her absence, and I honor all the ministers and everybody here. Um, and, and this month is truly a time to celebrate uh, our leadership. Amen. Can we give them a hand one more time? Amen. Amen. Come on, you could do better than that. Thank you for leadership, God. Thank you for leadership. Hallelujah. Thank you, God, for leadership. Thank you for leadership. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah, chapter 4. You guys going to help me preach today? I need some help. The more you help me, the shorter I preach. <laughs> but if you don't help me, then we might be here a couple hours. Amen. 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 Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. If you get there, or when you get there, give me an amen. And it's on the board as well. Nehemiah chapter 4, four verse 1. But it came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews, or in other words, what do these weak guys think they're doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they build themselves up? Will they strengthen themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? Somebody say, yes, we will. Verse 3, now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him. So we got two mockers here. And he said, even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. So a fox is going to tear down what we got. I think not. Verse 4. Hear, O our God, for we are despised, and turn their reproach upon their own head, and give them for a prey in the land of captivity, and cover not their iniquity, and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee. How many of you have ever prayed that prayer? <laughs> For they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. So built we the wall. This is Nehemiah talking. And all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof. Now I want you to pay key attention to this last, these last seven words here. For the people had a mind to work. Shout that with me. For the people had a mind to work. 
Amen. Would you lift your voice, your hearts, and your hands one more time? And would you pray out loud for an anointing to fall in this sanctuary as the word of God is brought forth? Come on, lift up your voice again. Lord God, we thank you. Send your fire. Send your anointing. Lord, send transformation. Send transformation. Transform us by the renewing of our minds. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, give them a shout one more time. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. We bless your name. We bless your name. And you may be seated. You may be seated. It was in the year 1979, after hearing the most popular home-born recording artist of the time sing his number one hit, that the men who sat on the Georgia General Assembly adopted Georgia on my mind as the official state song. R&B artist Ray Charles was just one of the many recorded that recorded the lyrics associated with this hit track. Oh Georgia, no peace I find. Just an old sweet song keeps Georgia on my mind. Those words, they represent a sliver of regurgitated lyrics that has its origins way back in the 1930s. No doubt there were some things on Mr. Charles's mind, along with many of us here today, that keep us somewhat shackled and bound that, in the words of Mr. Charles, cause us to misplace our peace. A few amens early on. In fact, I rise here to tell you this afternoon that, sure, you can stay wrapped up in the lyrics of vain songs, and you can remain attentive to the mere distracting jargon that the world spews in our direction. And you can allow the fiery darts of the enemy that are thrown at you through familiar human faces to incite vengeful anger in you. And you and your young ones and old ones here today, you can submerge yourself blindly into the latest fashions and trends and dreams and dramas that this increasingly immoral and vain society calls the norm. And you can remain a slave to the sin in your life or to the financial woes or to the politically correct world we live in that strives to distract us and push us from he that can be the only center of one's joy. But need I remind you here this afternoon that if that is how we choose to spend our thoughts and imaginations in these spiritual critical times, then true peace for us and a lost and dying world around us will continue to remain just out of our grasp. Hallelujah. But I choose to... Lay up for myself treasures in heaven where thieves cannot break in and steal and moth and rust cannot destroy. I choose to put things in an eternal place where I one day will meet my Savior. See, some, some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will, nay, we must Remember the name of the Lord, our God. We must remember the name of the Lord, our God. And I don't know about you, but I am persuaded that neither death, that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, not my mama, not my data, not my children, not my schoolmates, not my boss, not my co-workers. No one shall separate me from the love of Christ Jesus. No one, nothing. 
I preach to you today. We must have a heavenly mentality. We must maintain in the midst of destructive disaster around us. We must maintain a heavenly mentality. Can we shout unto God with a voice of triumph? We must maintain a heavenly mentality. It was in the midst of fierce and great Babylonian captivity that one named Hanani, a brethren of Nehemiah and fellow Jews who had escaped from captivity, he came and painfully deposited the news concerning the condition of the walls and gates of Jerusalem. The very entities that guarded the city of the people of God from its enemies. The walls, he says, therefore are broken down. And the gates are burned with fire. Hanani gives us the condition of our fortress. Hanani gives Nehemiah the condition of the city of our God, that which we have guarded, that which we have kept over the years. Hanani gives the news that we have slacked and we have come to the point where we no longer think with a heavenly mentality, but rather we think in terms of a temporal world. Without a second thought, Nehemiah's heart became broken and contrite upon receiving such a ghastly report. And he sat and wept and mourned for certain days. He even kept the pantry doors shut and the refrigerator doors closed. Stay with me now. It was after much prayer and petitioning to the Lord that Nehemiah went before the king during meat to perform his most depressing task, wine tasting. He was the cupbearer to the king, Artaxerxes, and his job was to taste the king's drinks before the king tasted it. Why? Because if there was any poison in the drink, Nehemiah would have to suffer the consequences. What a job. What a task. But Nehemiah faithfully did what he had to do. And apparently he did it with a smile on his face. Because this particular time, Nehemiah came and Artaxerxes realized something different about Nehemiah. And he said, why is thy face brought low? Why art thou sad, Nehemiah? And you would think that such a wise king would understand that this man pretty much takes a bullet for me every day. Maybe that's why he's sad. But Artaxerxes thought something else, and he was right. Nehemiah came to Artaxerxes because the walls of the city and the gates of his God were burned down. And Nehemiah came with a request to the king, and the king asked, what is thy request? And Nehemiah did not look to man first, but the Bible says before he even gave an answer that he prayed and looked to God. And the king said, whatsoever you have to do, I grant you. And he asked him, how long will you be gone? And what is the time that you will return? But the, Nehemiah didn't give an answer right away. 
And that tells me that he was going to be gone for as long as it took to rebuild the gates. He was going to tarry there as long as it took to change his world from a carnal mentality to a heavenly mentality. He was going to go and he was going to tarry certain days until it was time for his return. And it was not time until the walls and the gates were rebuilt. So we fast forward now. And the decree is given. And Nehemiah can go and rebuild the walls. And he can fortify the gates. And we get to these men and women that have come with him to rebuild the walls and the gates around the city. And here there are mentioned ten key gates. Ten key gates that, that they took the time and put effort into to rebuild. And each gate had a specific name, which I won't necessarily go into today. But I will tell you the names of these gates, and they have significance to the walk of a Christian man and woman. They are the progression of the Christian life. And first, they built the sheep gate. And second, they built the fish gate. And then the old gate, and the valley gate, and the dung gate, and the gate of the fountain, and the water gate, and the horse gate, and the east gate, and the gate of Micad. And they built these ten gates surrounding the city. And each gate had a specific function in the spiritual realm. Each gate showed us how we as men and women that were lost come to God, and how we maintain our salvation. The sheep gate, if you will, represents our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For he was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And if you're going to come to God, you must bring your sacrifice, and you must bring and carry your cross, and you must keep Jesus and his gospel on your mind. And the fish gate, after we have been born into salvation, the fish gate represents the fact that we must obey the great commission of the Gospels, that Jesus will make us fishers of men, and we'll be able to cast our nets to draw men and women, just like he drew us, to the house of God. And the old gate, the old gate reminds us to remember the provisions of the Lord. We don't need a new religion. We don't need a new gospel. We don't need something else to tickle our ears. But I say to you today, give me that old time religion. That's good enough for me. The valley gate. Many of us experience valleys in our lives. We experience tough times. We come on tough times and we have struggles. And many of us in here right now are having struggle, struggles. Struggles that maybe have only lasted for about a month now or a few days, but some of us have struggles that have lasted 15 and 20 years. But the valley gate was orchestrated in the plan of a Christian life. God knew that we would have valleys. In fact, God expects us to have valleys. He expects us to go through tough times. And notice with me the first three gates that I mentioned. If you look at a map and you see the way these gates were laid out, the first three gates were in close proximity to one another. But we come upon the valley gate, and it's some distance from the old gate. Because... You're going to have your honeymoon phase in the Lord. You're going to have the sheep gate of repentance and baptism. 
and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. You're going to have your fish gate where you're running around and you're winning souls and you're preaching the gospel and you're so excited. And you're going to have your old gate where you remember what the Lord has done for you. But there comes a time where the valley gate comes. And the valley gate is so far from the previous gate and the next gate, which represents to us that the valley may well be very long. The tough time may, ve may well be very long. You may have to go through something for a few years, for a few days. But need I remind you that after the valley gate comes the gate of the fountain. After the valley gate comes rivers of living water. After the valley gate comes provision. After the valley gate, God will bear you up on eagle's wings. After the valley gate, after the valley gate, don't stop before you rebuild the valley gate. Amen. In chapter 4 now, we see the two mockers that we read earlier about, Sanballat and Tobiah. They tried to intimidate, to distract, to make fun of, and even attack the efforts of the builders to build up walls and barriers in their lives. They tried to derail and confuse, and even to attack these builders. Understand that Tobiah and Sanballat represent the spirit of the age, the son of perdition, the spirit of Antichrist. There are many of them in our world today and the goal of these spirits, the goals of these things that come against us to distract us and to keep us from building and maintaining our gates, their goal is to destroy the gates. Because even in that chapter, we read that after trying to mock them and intimidate the builders, after trying to make fun of them and call them names. They realized that that didn't work very well. They realized that something else had to be done. So the Bible in chapter 4 of Nehemiah says that these two men came against them with other men to fight and to attack. Let me tell you today, if the enemy can't get you with the little foxes, he will bring the storm and the thunders and the rain. But one thing I admire about Nehemiah and these builders is that towards the end of that chapter, he says that despite what went on around them, the people had a mind to work. I stand to declare to you today that despite what we see going on in our world, despite what we feel coming up against us, despite the temptation to go here and to go here, it is incumbent upon the people of God, the apostolic Pentecostal church, it's incumbent upon us to maintain that narrow road that leads to life. For any other road leads to destruction. Where is our heavenly mentality? Where is our priorities? Where are, is our focus? Where are our dreams? What do we think about on a daily basis? What do we dream about on a daily basis? My God, my God, my God, we need a heavenly mentality. We need a heavenly mentality. 
I want you to notice some key points with me as we jump back real quick to chapter 3. Here is where we are told who built and what they built. And I would like you to indulge me for a moment and look at verse 8 with me if you have your Bibles. There was a man named Hananiah. And the Bible tells us that he was the son of an apothecary. In layman terms, he was the son of some guy who owned a fragrance shop. Insignificant, unknown, didn't have anything really to offer. He was the least in the kingdom. He was the son of a fragrance shop owner. He wasn't even the fragrance shop owner. He was the son of the fragrance shop owner. He sold perfumes and colognes to the hard workers. Yeah, that's what he did. But let me tell you, he, it, it doesn't matter who you are or where you come from or how old or young you are. God is calling every one of us to the city to build. He is calling every one of us to his city to do a work for him now. Not when you get it all together. Not when all your bills are paid up. Not when your kids are 12 and 13 years old and you can leave them at home by themselves. Now is the appointed time. Now is when we must work. We don't have time to make excuse. We don't have time to put it on the back burner. Now is the time that God is calling us. We must have heaven on our mind. We must have heaven on our mind. There is no greater goal for me than to make it through the pearly gates. 12 foundations, 12 gates, the city where the Lamb is the light. That is my city, and I will be there. Heaven must be our mentality. I also want you to notice with me that in verse 10 and 23 and verse 30 of chapter 3, that some of the builders had to work on the gates and walls of their own homes first. Yeah. Don't expect to come into the kingdom of God. Don't expect to work amongst brethren and sisters. And you haven't even gave your home life and your personal life a thought. We have each and every one of us, we have certain things within us that we must address before we can sincerely come before God Almighty and offer our services. For if you don't, your services and your prayers and your petitions may very well fall on deaf ears. Matthew chapter 7 tells us that some folks during the judgment will stand before God and declare all the great works they've done for the kingdom. But Jesus will look them right in the face and will profess unto them, I don't know you. I don't know you. Why? Don't you know me, God? Have I not done many wonderful works in thy name? Have I not spoken in other tongues? Have I not helped the sick? Have I not fed the poor? Have I not clothed the naked? But Jesus will look at you square in the eye and will tell you that he doesn't know you. Why? Because you started working on the gates of the kingdom but you did not work on the gates of your own home. The Bible says in Malachi 
Go, offer those things unto your governors and to your kings. Will they accept it? Will they regard it? You don't treat the priestess among us. You don't treat the most prestigious among us like we treat God from time to time. Oh, can I get an amen? We don't treat them like that. But when it comes to the one that redeemed my soul, when it comes to the one that gave me bread when I was hungry, that gave me water to drink when I was thirsty, that gives me everlasting drink from his well, when it comes to the one who is called Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Raphael, Jehovah Sitkanu, Jehovah Emkadesh. We sit and we do nothing to our own gates. But I come to tell you today, we must renew our minds and receive in our hearts a heavenly mentality. The lie that the devil tells and subsequent mistakes Christians make because of that lie is this, that the work that we do for the kingdom of God will somehow reap us instant benefits. The mistake that we make oftentimes as people of God is, well, if I give $100 to missions, God, I expect a tenfold return on my investment next week. The mistake that we make as Christians is to think that our reward is an earthly one. Sure, God will bless with earthly rewards, but our mentality is off if we think that that is the ultimate reward. We do not serve the kingdom to receive earthly benefits. You receive earthly benefits because you serve the kingdom. But your benefit, the Bible says, is laid up in heaven. The Bible tells us to wait, therefore, for our reward. For we will wear a crown. And we will reign and rule with him forever. That is the reward of sacrifice. That is the reward of the saint of the most high God. We need a heavenly mentality. We need a mental refreshing. We need to wash everything that is not biblical away. Everything that we've that we've taught, every tradition and rudiments and traditions of, of men and vain deceits. We need to wash those away out of our minds. Because we are strung up on false made up promises that the Bible never declared. And we struggle day after day after day because we think, God, you're supposed to do this and you're supposed to be here right now and you're supposed to bless me with this because I've done all this. You're wrong. The Bible does not teach that. God will no doubt bless you here on earth, but he doesn't want you to have an earthly mentality. He wants you to think heavenly and to do what we do because of heaven. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. The other thing I want to bring your attention to is the fact that all throughout chapter 3 of Nehemiah. And I want us to really pay attention here because throughout that chapter, God doesn't just simply 
name or mention that there was a bu bunch of builders who builded a bunch of gates. The end. God took time to move upon Nehemiah to write every name, every task, every deed. Who built it? When they built it? In what order they built it? Who they were next to when they built it? How long they worked on it? God remembered it all. God remembered it all. And we toil and we work and we toss and we think that God does not remember what we're doing. But I declare to you today that he does remember. It's written in the Lamb's book of life. It's plastered upon the heavenly walls. When you walk through the gates of heaven, I imagine there will be a whole section for yourself of everything that you did for the kingdom, even things that you don't even remember. But God remembers. God remembers that so-and-so maintained a heavenly mentality. So-and-so maintained a heart for my kingdom. So-and-so did not make excuse, but so-and-so stepped up to the plate, remembered the provisions of God, and was mindful of souls, and worked for both goals. They worked for heaven, and they worked for souls. Malachi chapter 3, 16, verse 17, th 16 through 17, tells us, Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts. In that day when I make up my jewels, I will remember them. In that day when the trumpet sounds, I will remember them. Yeah. In that day when the roll is called up yonder, I will remember them. I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. We're not living for this temporary old world. Let's not be caught up in all the cares of this world, for he saith, cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Cast your cares upon him, for he cares for you. In other words, he wants your mind to be clear and your goal to be sure. That our purpose is to not be caught up in the affairs and the cares, but to be caught up in kingdom work. Yes, we've got families. Some of you can look at me and say, well, Chris, you ain't got no family. But need I remind you that when God set up the tabernacle plan, that in the midst of the camp was the house of God. And no doubt all those people had their families and had their children and had mountain 
mountains of responsibility. But one thing they did day in and day out was to pitch their tents right next to the house of God. That when they opened their doors and when they peered through their windows, they saw the Shekinah. They saw the glory of God, and I feel my help coming right now. They saw the glory of God. They saw the Shekinah. They saw the house of God. They weren't hidden in their houses. They weren't tucked away in their affairs. But they saw the house of God. So don't give me your excuses. For we ought to be pitched right next to the house of God. Yeah, when I, when I get a family, I'll know. I'll see. And yeah, I'll go through the same struggles. But some of us sit and use the struggle as a crutch. I'm going to go through my struggles, and I'm no saint. Don't get me wrong. I'm going to go through my struggles. I'm going to go through the cares of having so much responsibility with a family and whatnot. But I will not, I will not just sit and use it as a crutch. I say this before God and every human being and saint of God in this house. Do not use your situations as a crutch. Do not ask people to feel sorry for you. I'm sorry if that hurts somebody's feelings, but I'm not the one that judges your soul. I'm just telling you how God feels about it. The builders kept a sword in one hand and a tool in the other. They were ready to defend the gospel. They were ready to fight against would-be enemies. But they also kept building. They also kept working. They continued steadfast in the gospel, in the work of the kingdom. They maintained a heavenly mentality. My God. And we ought to do the same. We ought to do the same. We must build and defend. We must watch and we must pray. Where are our minds at? What do we spend time dwelling on? Where and to whom and to what do we give our thoughts? Do we hand over our thoughts to the hand of the enemy? Do we daydream about vanity? Where are your thoughts? Where are your dreams? I'm a procrastinator from time to time. I'm getting better. But we procrastinate as people of God so much. And then when it comes time to get the stuff done, we ain't got no time. I ran out of time, Pastor. I ran out of time. I didn't have time to do it. I, I didn't have time to pray for that person. I didn't have time because I procrastinated and I kept my head in Clash of the Clans. Forgive me. You say, well, I don't waste time. I read lots, lots of books. 
I don't necessarily waste time. I'm gaining knowledge by reading all these books. How many of those books that you read saved a soul? Unless it was the Bible, probably zero. What do we make as our priorities? And I know I'm belaboring this point, but we need a priority shift. We need to rearrange some things on the order of our list. Some of us got some things at the top of the list that have no business being there. We need to rearrange. If we're going to reach this community, nay, if we're going to go to heaven, <laughs> we got to rearrange our list. If we're going to see the power of God working in this church, we got to change our list. We got to change some things around. I know I'm not preaching about pastor today, but I asked him before I preached, I said, I'm just going to preach. He said, go ahead. We got to change our list. Check your mind. And in so doing, you'll find the root of your actions. Let me say that again, because that went over like a lead balloon. Check your mind. For in so doing, you will find the root of your actions. It starts here. Be ye transformed by what? The renewing of this thing. We serve God with this thing. Cast down every high thing that exalteth itself above the knowledge of God. Every imagination. Every vain thing. It comes into our minds and we allow them to linger. And then we wonder why we're struggling with that sin. We struggle with those things because we allow the thoughts thereof to linger. And when they linger, they go from here to here. And then it goes from here to an outward manifestation of your thoughts. But where, where did, it, did, it, did it start? In your mind. That's why God spends so much time telling us to clean up the mind. He spends very little time telling you to watch your actions and to clean up your actions. He even told the Pharisees, yeah, you kind of look good on the outside, but it's the inside that looks like a grave. He spends very little time focusing on how you look on the outside. He spends a lot of time, though, focusing on the inside. We are who we are based on who we are inside. Priority changes. Hallelujah. How much time is absolutely wasted on meaningless, vain things among us? Count it up how much time is wasted on researching nonsense. How much time is wasted on going to the latest news magazine, I don't know what any of them are called, and looking up what Susie wore on the red carpet. H how much time is wasted? How much time is wasted on these vain television shows? We say we don't believe in drugs and alcohol and premarital sex. We say we don't believe in these things and lying and homosexuality, and cheating. But we watch it like madmen. Nathan, go to the last verse of Romans chapter 1.
who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasures in them that do them. Put that on the board for me. Romans chapter 1 verse 32. I'm running long, but y'all ain't helping me, so it's your fault. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. So if you commit it, you're worthy of death. But, wait a minute, not only do the same, but have pleasure. And the folks on your television that do it. We laugh, we snicker, we giggle. <laughs> but then we'll go on our jobs and we'll walk with our noses in the air and say, I don't do that. Don't tell me that joke because I'm a Christian and I'm not involved in that stuff. I don't lie. I don't cheat. I don't steal. But you watch it. You enjoy it. You're guilty of the same thing. Pleasure in them that do, do it. You say, or we say, we're not hypocrites. Oh, on the surface, we're not. But let me get into some of our houses. And I can find a lot of hypocritical things. And you're no better off, we're no better off than our coworkers and the people that are around us on a daily basis. We're going to the same hell that they'll go to if they don't get saved. Oh, y'all don't believe me. Okay. Meaningless, wasted time, vain things. You know, our priorities really ought to be relationship with God, taking care of your family, and church ministry. Relationship with God, taking care of family, and church ministry. That's the order. That's okay. That's perfectly fine. But here's what, where I find a problem. That, Brother Nathan, we've got relationship with God. Then right under it, we've got the family, which is fine. But then church ministry is down here somewhere. You've got the order right, and you feel justified in saying, I've got the order right. But that doesn't mean that the order is all spread out. These things are interwoven together. The makeup of a Christian involves all these things working in harmony. Don't neglect church ministry just because you've got a big family to take care of. Don't neglect a relationship with God just because you're involved in so many ministries in the church. Don't neglect your family just because you're at church 24-7. But don't have one way down here and the other two all the way up here. Amen. Is that right? Is that right? Amen. There's, this is the last point I want to make before I close. There is a library in Paris, France, that is one of the biggest libraries in the entire world. And this library has a section 
of books that if put up against each other, they would stretch three and a half miles long, this one section of books. And you know what that section of books is called? It's called the obsolete science book section. In other words, it is the section of the library with three and a half miles long of science books that have been put out of date because the information within the pages are no longer relevant. But we spend so much time concerning ourselves with science and earthly matters and things of this world. We are wrapped up in the conspiracy of theory. Amen. But there is one book that has stood the test of time with 40 different authors over a 1,500-year span. Scientists have even gathered together 51 facts back in the 1950s that clearly disprove the Bible. And if you talk to any scientist nowadays, they will tell you that those 51 facts are absolute rubbish. They are irrelevant. Because instead of disproving the Bible, all it did was prove my word of God. That Bible is about one and a half inches thick. It doesn't stretch three and a half miles long. God needed one and a half inches to tell you about this world. Magellan and all these sailors told us that the earth was flat. But Job told us over 5,000 years ago that the earth is round and that it hangs on nothing. And about 30 years ago, a bunch of intelligent scientists realized that the earth is round and it hangs on nothing. I'm telling you, you can't trust in this world and the things thereof. We must maintain a heavenly mentality. We must maintain a heavenly mentality. The Word of God is sure. It has stood the test of time. It is infallible. You don't need nothing else. If you want to straighten your family out, get in the book. If you want to know how to act right, get in the book. If you want to get rid of some things in your life, some baggage in your life that doesn't belong there, get in the book. Open up those one and a half inch thick pages and find out the secret to the fulfillment of life. Get in the book a heavenly mentality. Let's all stand. A heavenly mentality. Oh, speak. Oh, God. Really, Kondore Kasha. Ranamasito Yabeko Soto Robo Shata. Rilaba Kotoro Robo Shandayada. 
There's a spirit of travail in here. There's a spirit of travail in here. Maybe next week the rest of these brethren will get you all revved up. But God didn't put that in my heart. He put a heavenly mentality. We can be all revved up all we want to and still go to hell. We need a heavenly mentality. We need a heavenly mentality.